Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you.
and prepare a meal for one of those days. Uh, more information will be on the bulletin boards very soon. Um, also, we have Trunk or Treat in the works. We're starting planning for that. Um, it'll be on October 31st with more details to follow. So keep that date uh, in mind and think about that as we, uh, as we get more information in the days to come. Um, and then a number of opportunities to serve here at the church. Um, we need some volunteers for our children's ministry activities on Sundays. Um, we also need someone to be a lay reader for the 11 o'clock a.m. worship, um, which would be um, just uh, reading the scripture each Sunday. Um, and you would uh, do a rotation. There will be a sign up outside the church office for that as well in the future. Um, consider joining our resounding praise team band. We need some uh, instruments for our praise team. If you know anybody who might be interested, um, please send them our way. And then also on Thursday evenings, we'll be getting our cantata choir practices um, starting this week. Um, so keep all of those things in your hearts and minds as we move forward into this year. has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. When the sun sets free, oh, it indeed, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who the sun sets free. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who say I am. Yes, yes I, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, oh is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, 
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Atoning sacrifice of his life hallelujah you and of my sin Jesus you are stronger more than any other hallelujah what a savior jesus you are higher my soul's deepest desire hallelujah savior. you are the shepherd king you lead us by still waters hallelujah you are savior are my only hope your kindness is my friend in your presence you restore us Jesus you are stronger more than any other hallelujah what a savior Jesus you are higher my soul's deepest desire Hallelujah, you are Savior. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are my joy and my salvation. Stood in my place, taking my shame upon your shoulders. Jesus, you are stronger more than any other hallelujah what a savior jesus you are higher my soul's deepest desire hallelujah you are You may be seated. At this time, we invite all of the children forward for our children's moment um, with Paul. Good morning. I have something to show you this morning, and I want you to. Tell everybody what it looks like. Flower. Can you describe it? No. No? <laughs> I hope they got, a, yeah, they got a picture up there for you. Um, this little flower is one I discovered tromping around in the marsh decades ago and you would walk right by it because it's so small but when you look at it what's it got in the middle what's that look like in the middle there uh, oh, it does yeah it has that it's got it looks like somebody to me took a paintbrush and painted a little star in that flower, a little gold star. And then they took a little teeny paintbrush and painted a red outline on it. You know, if your dad called 
to order your mom flowers, I don't think he'd, he'd pick this one. This would probably be the last flower he would ask the florist to do. He wouldn't send her a dozen of these, which is called a marsh paint, would he? What would he send her a dozen of, maybe? Flowers, but probably roses or something. It's the last flower you'd probably ever think of to ask a florist to send your wife or somebody you love. But look at that thing. Look at the detail in that little flower. Folks up there are seeing it too. What do you think? <laughs> you must be allergic. <laughs> Where are you <back>? pollen? <laughs> Uh, that flower talks to me about God and what he's like. Do you think that flower could just accidentally look like that? You do? No. What do you think? You think somebody must have thought about that and designed it? No? No? Not somebody, but big somebody. That thing has too much The, the most power kinds of little details in it that makes me think of God. When I look at you girls, I think of the same thing. You know, the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you ever hear that? Did you ever think about that? You're not an accident. God made you just like you are. It even talks about knitting you together. The Bible does. You ever seen anybody knit? Not something people do a lot anymore. But when you knit something, you don't just start out with a bunch of yarn and start do, 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 do whatever they do to do it. You have a plan in mind or else you come up with a, a scarf slash sweater slash, I don't know, hat and you, you end up with a mess. But if you plan it out and do it right, you end up with a beautiful piece of something to wear usually or a blanket or something. That's the way God started out to make you and me, is he knit us together. He had a purpose in that. And we shouldn't ever think that we're the last or the least necessarily because God made us special just like we are. But we also should be humble in that and know that God made us just like we are. God knit you together just to be just who you are, that special person that you are. Pastor Matt, I mean, excuse me, sir. Pastor Mark's going to talk about a scripture this morning about wanting to be the first and the best and the biggest, but it's like this flower. I think I'd just soon be the last if it's this pretty to be the last. What I want you to do, if you will, um, if you want to take this flower with you, I want you to, to take another flower, if you will, and give it to somebody that you don't know in this church right now and say, you were made special by God. Can you do that? Is that too much to ask? And then if you want to take an extra flower, take that one to your mom. Your mom, take that one to your mom for later. Okay? And then take one and give it to somebody you don't know and tell them God made you special. Can you do that? You find you a pretty one. There you go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you, you thought of us when you created us. You made us to be just who we are. You made these children, Father, just as they are. Help them to share that with their friends who need to know that, Lord, to understand that we're not accidents, that we're made by you, that we're loved by you, uh, and we're created for you. We thank you for these children. We pray you'd bless them, bless their lives, and help them to always remember that they're yours in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen.
Holy Spirit rain down, rain down, O Comforter and Friend, how we need your touch again, Holy Spirit rain. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard. Come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. Holy Spirit, rain down. How we need your touch again, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard, come and change our heart on your word, Holy Spirit. can know what God has in store. So open up heaven, open it wide, over your church and over our lives. Holy Spirit, As we stand on your word, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Well, friends, as we come to our time of prayer for and with one another, just a couple of quick reminders. Again, our prayer request cards are in each and every pew. So if they're lifted up in prayer by our congregation, make sure you fill out one of these cards and then drop them into the offering boxes on your way out. If it's something that is delicate or that you just want to be known between me and you, then just hand this to me once worship is over and we'll make sure that the, the prayer request gets to where it needs to be. Our prayer time with each other this morning is a responsive prayer. You'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And if you feel so led, you'll respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll respond by saying, Toward the end of our prayer time together this morning is a space of silence where if there is someone specific you want to lift up either out loud or just silently in your heart, at that time is available to you there as well. So let us all now go to the Lord in prayer together.
Most Holy Father, thank you for Jesus, our spotless and innocent lamb slain to take away our sin. Thank you that he willingly suffered betrayal, torture, and death for love of us. Thank you for saving us in the strong name of Jesus, Lord, in your mercy. Conform your church to your beloved Son and not to the world. Make it model his love, forgiveness, and purity to those who scorn or have forgotten such things. Through its words and deeds, lead many to the foot of Jesus' cross, there to receive life and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Help those of us who are comfortable in our Christianity to serve, defend, and provide for your persecuted and suffering church. Let us never, by scandalous words or selfish deeds, cheapen or debase their faithful witness to their Savior, and ours, Lord, in your mercy. We ask your blessing upon this congregation and all its ministries. Help us to take delight in glorifying your name through self-giving service to one another and to our community. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus exalts servanthood as an example of his loving obedience to his Father. It's easy for us to overlook or belittle those who actually are servants in everyday life. Bless them and adorn their labors with the loveliness of Christ's labors on our behalf. Help us to notice, honor, and compensate servants, laborers, hired hands, and others who do the work we'd rather not. Lord, in your mercy. Rulers and leaders, celebrities, and authorities are used to lording it over others. Give them a teachable spirit and humble heart. Make them eager to use their riches of intellect, authority, and station to serve the people entrusted to their care. Give each of us the grace, wisdom, and kindness to be true friends, neighbors, and to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. Raise up pastors and evangelists who boldly care for starving for your word. Help us to encourage and provide for them. Bless the seminaries as they teach them. Spiritual directors and mentors who shape them into your servant leaders. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Nurses, therapists, EMTs, orderlies, service. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for all your good and faithful servants, especially those whose deaths we mourn. Keep us steadfast in faith, firm in hope, constant in love, generous in service, and abundant in joy as we continue our earthly pilgrimage. Lead us in this life with the cross of Jesus going on before us. Bring us through his good work into the blessed kingdom where we find eternal life and joy in union with you and with all whom you have redeemed. Lord, in your mercy. Incline your ear to our prayers, dear Lord, and answer them according to your most gracious and holy will. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
Christ our Lord, as we pray the prayer, he still teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, One such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. I'll be real honest with you this morning. But when I think about greatness or what it means to be great, I can't say that this verse is normally how I would have always defined it. In fact, I would dare say that this verse is not always how I've lived most of my life. And as I look around, I don't think many people are living this kind of life in our country. And I wonder if we think about it that when our parents or our grandparents told us about being great or go and do great things, being last and being a servant is probably not what they told you. Now, every one of us has heard this verse before, whether it be in Sunday school or during worship as part of a sermon, and I don't doubt that every one of us, when we heard this verse, nodded our heads and agreed with it, but that's on Sundays. And then Monday came. Because Monday always come, doesn't it? When I was in seminary, we had to take three semesters worth of a class called mentored ministry. And what that meant was you partnered up with a preacher and you followed him around so he could show you kind of the ins and outs of what this kind of life is like. It's kind of like an internship. And I remember my last semester of seminary, I was about a month away from graduating. I asked the preacher I was doing, I said, let me ask you a question. The first week that I'm employed as a preacher, what do I do? Because up to that point, I had no pastoral experience. So what I wanted to know was, as soon as I walked into my office on that Monday morning, my first day on the job, what am I supposed to do? And he gave me some advice that I still use. He said, Sunday's coming. You just work backward from there. Now, what he meant was that you start your week knowing that Sunday's going to come. And you need to be ready for worship. And from there, you work your way backwards. 
and you add in Bible studies and small groups and visitations and meetings and all the things that happen during the week at a healthy church. And he's right. Because so far in my four plus years of ministry, there has yet to have been a week where Sunday didn't come. But this week I found my mind drifting towards Mondays. Because as long as I've been alive, there has always been a Monday after a Sunday. And these Mondays represent a chance for us to reflect on and put into practice what it is we talk about and learn on Sundays. So let's start there. I would dare say that for most of us, Monday's definition of greatness is different from Sunday's definition of greatness. Monday's greatness is about being number one, about being a winner, about being a success. It's about power and control and wealth and fame and reputation and status and position. I mean, have you ever seen the team that lost the World Series dancing around after the last game with two fingers in the air shouting, we're number two, we're number two? Probably not, and you probably never will. Can you imagine a political campaign whose slogan was, make America last? Probably wouldn't be very successful, would it? And who wants to be a servant at all anyway? Isn't that for the poor and the uneducated? Those without ambition or drive or goals? At least, friends, that's how it often works today. Being last of all and servant of all is not usually what we strive for, is it? That's not the greatness to which we aspire. But friends, if being great, if truly being great means being last of all and servant of all, then we have completely misunderstood what greatness is really all about. And it seems the disciples didn't understand greatness any more than we tend to. What were you arguing about along the way, Jesus asks them. But they were silent, for they had argued with one another who was the greatest. Jesus asked them a very simple question. And yet, instead of getting an answer, he receives only silence. And we know what that silence is, don't we? It's the silence of having been caught. It's the silence of having been found out. It's the silence of knowing that they shouldn't have been talking about this stuff in the first place. And we, we, when we consider what had just happened prior to their conversation, these disciples really should have been ashamed of themselves. Why? Well, consider this. Jesus at this point has not just once, but twice, passion. Peter's incorrect definition of the Messiah as well as the definition of what a true disciple looks like. And so now it happens again for a second time and either because they truly still don't get it or because they don't want to be called out like Peter was, the disciples didn't say anything to Jesus even though they didn't understand what it was he was truly talking about. Questions of Jesus. They didn't really seem to give what Jesus just told them very much thought at all and instead decided they'd have a conversation amongst themselves about what it means to be great and which one of us do you think is the greatest? One of my commentaries says it like this, the contrast could not be more striking as the disciples seek a place of public honor and status while Jesus is acting out the kingdom value of self-sacrificing servanthood. I think the disciples seem to be suffering from a couple of things that I worry plague each and every one of us from time to time. First, I think they chose not to understand what Jesus is saying. And second, they don't allow this death and resurrection language 
to reframe or change their perspective on anything. Jesus is speaking directly to them, and yet they don't ask questions. They don't seek clarification. They don't seem to have any interest in going any further to what Jesus is telling them. It's in one ear and out the other. They're hearing, but they're not listening. What about you? Are there times where you hear Jesus speaking to you, but maybe you aren't listening to what it is he's saying? Are you afraid to ask questions? Are you afraid to dig a little deeper? Are you afraid to go a little further? And then second, shouldn't this knowledge of the Word made flesh, God incarnate, choosing to walk this path towards crucifixion, to humble himself to the point of death, simply and solely out of his love for you, so that you can be free from the bondage of sin and death, so that you can have a relationship with our Creator God that asks only that you believe, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself, should not this knowledge change everything about how you view yourself, your world, your priorities, your goals, your relationships, everything about your life. It didn't for the disciples, it seems, or else Jesus wouldn't be asking them what it was they were arguing about. But Jesus isn't asking for his sake. He's asking for their sake because he already knew what it was that they were arguing about. Take note in our story that their argument happened on a public road out in the open as gathering information for himself, but he's inviting the disciples into a time of self-reflection as to the definition of true greatness. He's presenting the disciples with an image and the reality of their better selves, and he's doing it for us also. Now, don't misunderstand. Jesus is not saying that we cannot or should not be great. He never says that in our passage. But what he's asking us to frame our definitions of greatness. So how should we understand it? Jesus answers that question by taking a little child into his arms and saying to the disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. I want us to be real careful here because Jesus does not say that greatness is in being a child. And Jesus does not say that greatness is in being childlike. He says greatness is in welcoming the child. Now on its face, this really is not too difficult or challenging, is it? I mean, who wouldn't welcome a little child? One of the highlights of my week this past week has been the fact that we've started doing chapel services in here with our preschoolers. They focus on a different letter each week. In these first couple of weeks, they're focusing on the letter A. So in chapel, we chose a word that began with A, Agape, and we talked about God's love for each and every one of us. And one of the little girls got so excited, she raised her hand, she says, that means that God loves me right now. This is a great message for all of us. But Jesus isn't talking about that child. He's not talking about the child there on his lap. He's talking about what the child represents. The child is a symbol of, or something else. The child is a symbol for vulnerability, powerlessness, and dependency. You see, the children in Jesus' day had no rights, no status, no economic value. The child was a consumer and not a producer. Greatness, Jesus says, is welcoming and receiving into our arms one like this, regardless of his or her age. Greatness is found not in what we have accomplished or gained for ourselves, but in what we have done and given to the least of these. 
the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, all the symbolic children we encounter in each of our lives. What Jesus is saying to the disciples is that, that, is that those that choose to feed the hungry, those that give drink to the thirsty, those that clothe the naked, those that take care of the sick, those that visit the imprisoned, they are the great ones. Greatness never puts itself in a position of superiority over another. It's not about me, it's not about my nation, my tribe, my people, my politics, my bank account, my house, my job, my accomplishments, my reputation, my status. Our greatness is not revealed in any of those. It is others, regardless of. When he talks about inviting to supper those who cannot invite you back, guess what? He's describing greatness. <coughs> greatness comes to us when we share with others who have nothing to share with us in return. Think of the young boy who shared his five loaves and two fish with 20,000 people who had nothing to offer back but their hunger. He was similarly thinking about what the food pantry does here in our community. And I hope you do make time to watch the video put together that highlights what the food pantry does. Folks come here or they call here and we share with them as much food as they can possibly carry knowing that all they can offer in return is their humble thanks. But that's what being great looks like. <coughs> Greatness comes when we forgive one who has neither asked for our forgiveness nor changed his or her behavior. Greatness comes when we refuse to carry bitter bitterness or envy toward another. Greatness comes when we respond to the needs of others. Greatness comes when we refuse thoughts and actions of hatred or prejudice. <coughs> Greatness comes with our refusal to objectify the opposite sex or to join in jokes about minorities or foreigners. Greatness comes when we overcome fear, tear down walls, and make room for one who is different, vulnerable, and in need. Greatness comes, friends, when we look across to the person sitting in front of us, and we see the image of God. <coughs> but don't misunderstand. Greatness is not something to be achieved or earned. It is a quality that arises in our lives when we find ourselves to be in balance when we step into our better selves, when we allow the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to take root over <coughs> our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And that's the life that Jesus offers us. He offers us a chance to be perfect, just as our Father in heaven is perfect. And as we've discussed in Bible study, that does not mean morally perfect. It doesn't mean having perfect knowledge. What it means is being perfected in love. <coughs> How well is it that we're loving the Lord our God? How well are we loving our neighbor? That's how we can be made perfect, by loving totally and completely. And honestly, I'm not there yet, but that's the kind of life that Jesus, Jesus offers, and that's the kind of life that I want to live. I pray it's the kind of life that you want to live as well. Because I certainly want to be great, don't you? And this kind of greatness happens in the simple, the ordinary, and the mundane. It often goes unnoticed and unnamed, but it's there. And greatness is always a choice that is set before us. <coughs> Excuse me. Growing up, one of the TV stations based out of Greensboro had a program they called Wednesday's Child. Every Wednesday they would highlight some youngster in the community that was up for adoption or needed some kind of help with opportunities for us to help. <coughs> and you know what tomorrow is, right? It's Monday. And tomorrow, Jesus will set 
Monday's child in front of us. Monday's child will be found wherever we encounter someone different, vulnerable, and in need. Someone hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, or in prison. And Monday's greatness will tempt us and call us. Monday's greatness will tell us we don't have the time or the resources or they're in our way or they're beneath us. But there's another greatness, the greatness of the last of all and the greatness of the servant of all. I wonder who the child is that Jesus will set before us this week. I wonder who the greatness you and I Friends, just a quick reminder, we have two offering boxes here in the sanctuary, one at each door on your way out. If you brought a tithe, the gifts are offering with you this morning. I encourage you, if you have not done it already, to drop it off as you leave worship this morning. But it is in appreciation of your continued faithful giving and in anticipation of future gifts that I'd like to say a prayer over our tithes, gifts, and offerings at this time. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant us the grace to be extravagant in the gifts we give to you. Help us be wise and just in how we live with the resources we keep. Guide us in the ways to live lives that bear fruit that is pleasing to you, lives full of mercy and compassion. Free us from envy and selfish ambition that leads us away from you so we might draw nearer to you. We pray in the love and hope that is Jesus our Savior. Amen. Please stand. Oh, the Lord, our strength and song, highest praise to him belongs. Christ the Lord, the conquering King, your name we raise your triumph sing praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory by his name we overcome The storms of hell pursue. In dark night we worship you. You divide the raging sea. Death to life you safely lead. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory. By his name we overcome. All the saints and angels bow, host of heaven crying out. Glory, glory to the King, you reign for all eternity. Our mighty warrior, praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, by his name. We overcome. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious for his hand. We stand in victory. By his name we overcome. By his hand we stand in victory. By his name we overcome. Worthy is 
is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy. song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Ashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Creation, I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation, I sing praise to the King of Kings. Are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And I will adore you. My friends, as we leave this place and the week unfolds, we will all have opportunities to be great. The choice is ours. Great in the eyes of the world or great in the eyes of our Savior. We go now to love.